Over the past 10 years, we've worked with the Bertarelli Foundation through the Bertarelli Program in Translational Neuroscience to fund innovative, collaborative work that addresses some of the most difficult problems in neurologic disease. We've concluded 11 projects and we're about to embark on four more. We'll be building on the vision of the Bertarelli family to bring together scientists and physicians with different skills. All the work radiates from investigators at Harvard Medical School, but they'll be working with colleagues at Boston area hospitals and an international clinic in Basel, Switzerland. Over the next three years, three projects will focus on hearing and deafness and one that focuses on the management of pain. There's a huge societal need for new treatments for pain. Our research is focused on identifying alternates to opioid therapy. Opiates, of course, have a huge problem in that uh, they lead to addiction uh, and they are drugs of abuse. We know that there are six and maybe seven nerve cells that respond to painful stimuli. The goal of our work is to identify ways to switch them off. The nature of the work is highly collaborative. We have three teams working together on this project. As a group, we have, in my laboratory, genetic access to these neurons. Clifford is a world-leading expert in understanding pain information processing. And Bruce is a leading expert in understanding the physiological properties of nerve cells. Our ultimate goal is to identify or develop new drugs to inhibit pain-sensing neurons to prevent pain. We'd like to avoid affecting nerve cells that are underlying movement or gastrointestinal function, uh, which other drugs do. Opioids, for example, have severe side effects, including GI motility problems. We'd like not to have those problems. For me, what's great about the Bertarelli Foundation support for this research is that it's allowing three laboratories with complementary expertise to come together, really for the first time, and I think what each of the three laboratories brings to the table is greater than the sum of its parts, it's synergistic. So we're going to hopefully be able to do something really great here that none of the three laboratories by themselves could achieve. Most people think of hearing loss as simply turning down the volume on the world. But there's another form of hearing loss that's harder to detect and harder to even recognize as a problem, so we call it hidden hearing loss. In hidden hearing loss, actually the detector system is fine. The problem is with the neurons that have to encode all of the information. The information can come into the ear, but it's not presented to the brain in a way that you as a human being can make sense of it. As neurons and hair cells are exposed to even just moderate sounds, the synapses that connect the hair cells to the neurons can be broken. What we've been trying to do is find a way to just keep this from happening to begin with. We know we are all exposed to sounds. What can we do to just make those synapses more resilient from the get-go? So we thought, well, what protects the synapses to begin with? And could we just boost this? We've been inspired by work from Roz Siegel. She found a protein, BCLW, and showed that it could play this kind of protective role and provide resilience. Lauren Walensky came into the project. Lauren is a chemist. He can figure out ways to design a chemical that would do the same thing. Our dream is to find a way to provide a drug that would actually protect the synapses so that even with a lifetime of noise exposure you would still have all the synapses you started out with. And for all of us to be able to just uh, keep up a healthy and engaged life. When it comes to hearing, the brain is essentially a processor, allowing us to distinguish different types of sounds, such as a train coming towards us um, or someone speaking. In some cases, the brain has difficulty in interpreting sounds, patients who have had um, a stroke or another type of brain injury. This is also a problem in age-related hearing loss. When we're young, the brain has this remarkable capacity to readily adjust so connections between neurons are formed and lost and as we become adults this capacity of the brain is diminished. 
Our main aim is to identify new ways to stimulate brain plasticity beyond early life to restore hearing. One of the really exciting parts of this grant is its collaborative nature. Bernardo and I were separately looking at two different uh, signaling molecules that we believe are important for stimulating plasticity in the brain. And this grant has brought us together to understand what happens to allow rewiring of the brain that's important for auditory learning, such as allowing a new cochlear implant patient to learn how to use his or her new implant. The brain has to be able to adjust to be able to interpret these new signals from the ear. We hope that our research will allow us to identify new therapeutic strategies allowing the brain to relearn how to hear, and it's incredibly exciting. Usher syndrome is a terrible disorder in which children are born completely deaf and usually with no sense of balance. And then over the next 15 to 20 to 25 years, they become blind as well. For the deafness, cochlear implants can help. But for the blindness, there's really nothing that can be done for these patients. There are several different types of Usher syndrome. All of them involve the inheritance of a bad copy of a gene from the parents. In one type of Usher syndrome, type 1F, their ability to make a key protein, protocadherin 15, is impaired. And we've been working on protocadherin 15 for years to basically understand its normal function, but we realized we ought to be able to use this information to do something for patients with Usher 1F. And a few years ago, I met Jessica. My main hearing problems are noisy rooms because it's really difficult to differentiate between sounds and pitches. I started to realize my vision was beginning to go at a camping trip with my Girl Scout troop when all my friends could see by the moonlight and I could not. In a sense, we chose this problem not because it's easy, but because it's hard. We're trying to get the cells in the ear and the eye to make the normal copy of the protocadherin 15. Normally, we would use a small harmless virus to carry the gene into the cells but the gene for protocadherin 15 is too large to fit in this virus. And so we had to get clever. We've taken three different strategies to try to fit the instructions into the virus. In one, we've shortened it. In a second, we've cut the gene into two bits and put them separately into the cell with two different viruses. And in the third, we've used the virus to deliver a new tool which can actually change the patient's own gene in order to correct it. Usher syndrome type 1 is a rare disease, but we hope that we'll be able to halt or even reverse the developing blindness and give hope to patients like Jessica. My biggest challenge at 24 is a lack of independence. What would be amazing and life-changing for me is a cure to Usher syndrome. That's what I want more than anything in this world. Some would say the brain is the most complicated object in the universe. It has 100 billion neurons with nearly 100 trillion connections between them. The job of neuroscience for the last 40 or 50 years has been to understand this. But finally, we're at the point where we can take this understanding and begin to use it to develop treatments. And that's what makes the current research so exciting. While these four new projects are just in their infancy, all the investigators share the excitement and hope that the work that they do will lead to new therapies that change people's lives. Music